I'm uh, Sunil Agarwal. I'm a physician and researcher who uh, currently affiliated with the New York University Medical Center where I'm doing my residency final year in physical medicine rehabilitation. So I'm uh, speaking from New York City and uh, I want to give a talk today on uh, cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. Uh, the, this, this presentation was largely um, done recently at the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation meeting. Um, so this is very current uh, material and um, has uh, essentially uh, I'm trying to lay some scientific foundation for the medicinal use of cannabis and the science of the endocannabinoid system so that um, healthcare providers out there have a better idea why cannabis works the way it does, what, what sort of evidence base we have around it. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the, much of this material was not covered in uh, medical residencies or, or medical education. So there's a lot of catching up that needs to be done. But uh, I had the, the fortune of, I was fortunate to do uh, four years of a PhD uh, in medical geography where I studied uh, medicinal cannabis and had the opportunity to train in a medical cannabis state, Washington State, which uh, where I did, that's where I did my um, medical training, uh, PhD and resident internship. So I had some exposure to use of cannabis in clinical practice. So um, that's that's where I'm going to try to try to give this talk. And you know the important thing to know is in fact the the science of this, despite the fact that we know so much, is still in its infancy because of the lack of, of robust uh, availability of of um, controlled clinical research, uh, empirical treatment trials, access to cannabis, uh, tested uh, cannabis, uh, analyzed material, uh, and, and so on. So there's still a lot that uh, needs to be worked out, but um, some basic principles are there, which, uh, which certainly can help you know, guide uh, later on uh, research development. So without further ado, let's talk about cannabis and endocannabinoid system in a concise clinical primary case series. So I, I want to declare that I don't have any financial relationships um, with any uh, interest. I am getting a speaker fee to speak here with you today. Um, uh, the talk will discuss FDA unapproved uses of drugs. Uh, and that's quite a bit of medical practice today goes on with FDA unapproved uh, drug uh, uh, drug uses, off-label as we say. So this is the outline uh, we're going to go through, a, a little bit of history, uh, and pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, adverse effects, drug interactions, indications uh, in case series. This was very close to the outline that I followed in a paper that I recently published in the Clinical Journal of Pain, uh, Volume 29, Number 2, 2013. You can see uh, cannabinergic pain medicine, concise clinical primer, and survey of randomized controlled trial results. Um, you can let the uh, organizers know, uh, and I can send you a copy of that paper. So, well, so this was the outline that I used in that paper. So let's start with history. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So uh, history of cannabis in, in medicine is um, quite impressive, actually. It turns out that cannabis was in part of the materia medica of numerous medicinal systems um, throughout history. The earliest documentation we have is from ancient Egypt and um, Chinese pharmacopoeias, but uh, the Indians and, and, and the Middle East um, all utilized cannabis in medical practice. Uh, and then even in more modern medical times, uh, ever since the British physicians were in India in the 1830s studying uh, indigenous medical practices, that's sort of when the boom of cannabis in the West 
uh, was uh, surfaced. So until about 1840 to about 1940, there was maybe a thousand or two thousand different medicinal preparations sold by major pharmaceutical houses that contained cannabis or were solely cannabis. Um, and uh, you can see an example here of a cannabis bottle that was um, produced by uh, the Mulford Company, uh, pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia, and it contained cannabis in it, and the treatment was for neuralgia, which is interesting because there's a lot of research nowadays that shows that cannabis is useful for nerve pain. Um, the William Osler, the father of uh, internal medicine, Sir William Osler, Sir Dr. William Osler, he had recommended cannabis as the most superior treatment for migraine headaches in his first textbook of internal medicine and several subsequent editions. Um, there was uh, several, you know, the, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, the, the Queen Victoria's personal physician, uh, our Dr. Reynolds had also used cannabis for numerous conditions. And there's quite a bit of interest in the Victorian and early 20th century in this treatment and unfortunately politics uh, and good old uh, American prejudice has gotten in the way and caused this medicine to sort of be fall out of favor. Uh, another way to look at history is by studying the publications in the National Library of Medicine uh, and finding out when cannabis or cannabinoids as a term was used in the overall medical literature. So you can do that search each for each year from back as far as 1960 all the way to last year. Uh, and that's what this graph is showing is how many hits you get. And, uh, and it's a quite, quite a large number as you can see it's been increasing uh, since the early 90s. Um, but the graph also tells you a different history of kind of the uh, moments in cannabis and cannabinoid science, the important moments. So, uh, Hopefully, see my pointer here. But uh, in the mid 1964 is when THC was isolated and one of the active ingredients in cannabis by Raphael Mashu in Israel. And after that, there was a, a pretty significant resurgence of interest in the science of cannabis all throughout the late 60s, early 70s. Around this time, the United States government uh, had was conducting a United States uh, panel study of uh, marijuana use and the um, Presidential Commission. And there was a lot, a lot of funding given to researchers and a lot of publications at that time. When the panel recommended that, that the, the drug did not, was safe enough to not warrant uh, criminal penalties for, for use and invest medical investigation, quite, quite a large multi-volume report that essentially uh, took a scientific angle. The report was uh, not, recommendations were not implemented uh, and throughout the late 70s there was a, a concomitant drop in, in research publications in this area up until the early 80s when there was really an absolute dip you know, as uh, throughout the Reagan administration and Bush won. 1988 represented another milestone in cannabis science. The cannabinoid receptor was first cloned by Dr. Alan Howlett at Washington University of St. Louis and her, her group. Uh, so this was the first time that a specific target for a cannabinoid from the cannabis plant was identified in, um, in this case it was a mouse, but later it cloned in the human, um, discovered in the human and cloned. And that for the longest time, people had no idea if there was a specific receptor for cannabinoids. Uh, and there was a very vague idea so that maybe the cannabinoids dissolve into the lipid bilayer of the cell, and they sort of work non-specifically. Nobody really knew uh, that there was a specific receptor. In uh, 1992, they discovered, again, in uh, Mashulim's lab in Israel, with the, the collaborator, uh, William Devane, that there was actually an endogenous cannabinoid. If there's a receptor in the body, then certainly the body is making a ligand to bind to that receptor, and that uh, was discovered in 92. 
uh, since that time, several other cannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors have been discovered, and there's just been a flurry of interest and research in this area as we discovered how widespread cannabinoid signaling is in the brain, nervous system, and other major physiological function systems, not just in humans, but in numerous organisms, uh, all the way down to hydra. Uh, also, during this late 90s, and uh, as you can see, there was a uh, lot of research, which is also co coinciding with the increasing uh, legalization of medicinal use of cannabis in uh, states across the U.S. Uh, now there's 20 of them, but the first state, uh, 96, uh, was California, and, and that, I think the research also peaked uh, as uh, physicians and patients were reintroduced to legitimate use of cannabis medicine. So there's some other ways to look at these numbers at the bottom here. Uh, 2.3 publications a day for the last 20 years. So this is a huge amount of new science, and there's no way we can even begin to summate all of that, but we'll pick, up, pick some highlights. So uh, another way to look at these numbers, uh, in, in a literature review that was published in 2009 by Hamus from Israel, um, he showed that said that at that time, you can divide up the literature to 15,000 articles on chemistry and pharmacology of cannabis and cannabinoids and 2,000 articles on endocannabinoids. Another literature review uh, published in 2010 by Hasekamp showed that um, from the period of 1975 to 2009, if you want to look at strictly clinical studies, that is, studies using human subjects, 110 controlled clinical studies involving cannabis or cannabinoids had been published. And in total, those 110 controlled studies used 6,100 patients, uh, subjects, and with a wide range of different conditions. Uh, and that uh, is an important point to keep in mind, given that uh, the prevailing myth is that there's no research and very few people have been studied. And this number, 6,100, is, is much larger than many other drugs that are currently in practice, uh, used in practice. The United States government has won a cannabis clinical trial informally for, um, um, actually that's the fourth point, but um, before I go to that, the United States uh, has allowed 33 or so uh, trials of inhaled cannabis with cannabis grown at the federal uh, farm in Mississippi. University of Mississippi by uh, a grower and scientist named Mahmoud al uh, And that cannabis has been shipped out to various medical centers and studied in controlled clinical trials. A third of them were gold standard designed. And that's gone on for the last 30 or 40 years. They've compared that cannabis with placebos, other drugs, or oral THC in various uh, trials. And then there's been this long-term federal study that's gone on since the mid to late mid 70s when a uh, glaucoma patient uh, sued uh, the federal government because uh, they uh, for out of medical necessity because he found that cannabis eased his uh, eye pressure which was leading causing him to go blind and the federal judge sided with him and forced the government to begin issuing uh, cannabis and under an investigational new drug program compassionate use uh, to him and, and ultimately many several other patients who applied. Uh, and formally, this is a clinical study, but there's really been no official longitudinal data collected on those subjects, though some independent researchers have, have done their own the studies of these patients. That program is now closed, and, but, but four patients still receive cannabis from the federal government in that program who are grandfathered in. The science on cannabis has gotten to the point where you can, uh, in cannabinoids, where you can do what, what are called um, funnel plots. This is a type of plot that physicians and uh, researchers who study evidence-based medicine can tend to see. This is a form of a systematic review of meta-analysis where you can stack up trials um, that are looking at similar you know, interventions. Uh, and see if on balance, if you stack up all these trials, whether they support one side or the other. And uh, this, this is, uh, shows you that the large diamond at the bottom is a summation of the different weights 
of the different trials that are being, have been looked at uh, for nausea and vomiting for using cannabinoid medicines. Uh, there was 18 studies in this particular meta-analysis, and 13 of them were randomized trials. And uh, it, uh, with randomized trials involving cannabis, and you can see here that there is a statistically significant difference in patient preference for um, in favor of cannabis or its components versus the standard anti-emetic drug. Uh, and it's a very statistically significant P of P value less than 0 0.0001. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, no, please. Okay. So um, just just to sort of show you that this type of literature uh, exists out there. The American Cannabis Clinical Trials that I discussed earlier, uh, 33 trials. Uh, have been, uh, and so there's been more now, but um, in, in one paper I published in the Journal of Opioid Management, I summarized at that point in 2009 that these were the different uh, indications that the American trials had looked at with cannabis, appetite stimulation in healthy volunteers, uh, treatment of HIV neuropathy, or other forms of chronic neuropathic pain, spasticity in MS, weight loss, and wasting syndromes. Uh, elevated eye pressure and glaucoma, uh, asthma, vomiting. Uh, these are all. These all showed. Nearly all of them showed benefit for cannabis. Uh, and, and these various clinical trials also have helped to set the stage for the different types of indications that cannabis is being used for in the various states that now have medical cannabis laws on their books. The modern cannabis pharmacopoeia has different cannabinoid medicines available. Uh, and this is sort of just gives you an idea of those. I mean, this is, this is just the sort of official FDA cannabinoid medicines, but there really are other uh, types of cannabis medicines that are being used in dispensaries and various uh, local medicine systems. But as far as the FDA goes, uh, these four uh, THC pills on the left, which is 100% uh, pure THC dissolved in sesame seed oil in a soft gelatin capsule. It has been available since 1985 and now has gone generic. Uh, Cizamat or Nabilone is another chemical that's very similar to THC. It's also been available since 1985. Nausea and vomiting and cancer chemotherapy has its indication. The Dronabinol has also received uh, HIV wasting syndrome. Uh, treatment indication as well. And then skip to the far right, you see the cannabis cigarettes that the Mississippi Farm has uh, given in the research studies that I talked about earlier in a long-term study. And they, have, they carry a label that you can see here on the bottom of the screen. Uh, 300 cigarettes per can. Uh, the uh, average weight per cigarette about 0.847 grams. Uh, and um, herbal cannabis, uh, you can kind of, it's all rolled up here, but you can see the green poking out of this, this cannabis cigarette here. Herbal cannabis has about 460 different chemical constituents in it, about 100 or more than 100 different cannabinoids. And then since uh, 2006, the cannabis extraction um, called Sativex, but essentially it's a cannabis uh, is an oral cannabis uh, extract uh, has been available since 2006 in Canada for nausea for the treatment of uh, pain and multiple sclerosis. This is essentially a cannabis uh, preparation that is, is made by growing uh, in a greenhouse in England that a private company runs, uh, growing different cannabis strains and taking taking the harvest of cannabis with as a high THC and one strain of cannabis that has high CBD, grinding them up and dissolving them in liquid carbon dioxide, uh, and then doing some cleaning, cleaning up of the process and putting it in a uh, glycerol peppermint flavored uh, under the tongue spray. Uh, and it was given the name Nabixamol by the International Naming 
uh, pharmaceutical naming group, uh, but uh, it's essentially cannabis, liquid cannabis or a hash oil, highly refined preparation. And this company has done quite a number of studies uh, to win approvals in over 22 countries now for this cannabis uh, medicine. So um, that's, that's what there's, I'm going to show you in the middle picture there. It's in phase three clinical trials in the U.S., both for cancer pain, and I believe they started also a trial in MS. So now let's talk about pharmacokinetics of cannabis. So as I was saying, the best to think of cannabis is a herbal cannabinoid drug. Uh, six dozen different phytocannabinoids. What are, what are cannabinoids? Uh, these classical phytocannabinoids that technically of the class terpenophenolics. You have 21 chemical carbons. There's other things in cannabis in addition to cannabinoids, like other plants. Um, it has terpenoids, flavonoids, phytosterols. Terpenoids are like pine, limonene, smaller things that give the aromatic uh, aroma of not just cannabis, but other things in the plant kingdom, like limes and pine trees. Um, uh, phytosterols are like the, the things that that have sort of like estrogens and things like that, that plants make. The two important cannabinoids to think about are the THC and CBD, and it's important to know that they both appear in their acid form in the can in cannabis. That's carboxylic acid, COOH, uh, if, if you remember your organic chemistry. Uh, in order to activate cannabinoids, uh, you heat them, and it requires about five minutes of heating at 200 to 210 degrees Celsius for optimal maximum decarboxylating. But if your temperature is much higher, like if you find a flame, it's just a few seconds are required. Um, there's also science that shows the acid forms have interesting medicinal properties for immune system. But uh, this is less well studied area. Uh, pharmacokinetics continued. Uh, routes of administration for cannabis um, involve the lungs, the gut, and the skin. So by the lungs, we would inhale vaporized or smoked organic plant material. The pharmacokinetics is essentially like an IV bolus. Those of you who are familiar with IV administration in hospital, um, passing diffusion occurs from the lungs into the blood. Uh, and we, why it's like a bolus is because you have a rapid onset in seconds to minutes, maximal effect in about half an hour, and then duration about two to three hours. The PO route and gut route, you ingest lipophilic, alcoholic, or supercritical fluidic extracts of herbal cannabis. Uh, the supercritical fluidic extract is what the, uh, the Sativex, the uh, spray that I was showing you in the prior slide is, is, uh, would qualify as. And by the way, that's a technology uh, that's taken from the perfuming industry, supercritical uh, CO2 fluid extracts. Lipophilic extract means butter or oil, alcohol, uh, just like the classical tinctures that are made, uh, alcohol-based tinctures. Uh, people use other types of oil extractions as well. So essentially, the absorption time is more variable when you take it by the gut, uh, depending on stomach content. So it can, onset can occur at 30, to two, 30 minutes to two hours, but a longer duration of action and more constant, five to eight hours. There's also some lingual absorption as well. Skin is the topical application. There's topical application by the skin as well. Um, this is a less well study area, but we do know cannabinoids absorb into the bloodstream uh, through topical administration. And there's been some research in animal models on the use of cannabinoid creams to treat dermatitis, allergic dermatitis in animals and in rats. Uh, metabolism of uh, cannabinoids, uh, mostly plasma protein bound lipoproteins uh, bind the uh, THC in the plasma uh, and then they go through these hydroxylation, oxidation, and conjugation processes in the liver like many other, other drugs that are metabolized. And these are the different uh, enzyme systems that are utilized. Clearance uh, is pretty rapid. Um, First pass metabolism is more significant with oral administration. Uh, that is to say, the liver gets a hold of the cannabinoids first before the brain uh, nervous system does. Uh, and then the 11 hydroxy metabolite is formed, which has a higher blood brain barrier penetrability. 
and uh, uh, it's associated with more um, of a more potent effect. Um, again, it's eliminated, it's eliminated over several days uh, due to storage in fat tissues. Cannabinoids do distribute in breast milk. Uh, it's classified as pregnancy category C, which is the one that says that there's insufficient evidence here for or against the use of pregnancy. <coughs> And, and interestingly enough, breast milk itself contains natural cannabinoids um, that the mother uh, passes on to the infant. Excretion of cannabinoids occurs uh, days to weeks uh, and distributed in your feces. Science of cannabis has gone to the level of the genome. This is just a sort of picture showing you what herbal cannabis looks like in flowers. Um, on the left there, and looking at it under a microscope in the middle picture, you can see those white uh, things with the heads on them. Those are called glandular trichomes. And those are basically the medicinal business end of herbal cannabis. Uh, it's in those trichomes, which you can see with the electron microscope in the last picture, and the drawing of the, micro, of the, of the um, trichome on the bottom there, uh, bottom left. Uh, this is where cannabinoids are produced by cannabis. And uh, however which way you can get those cannabinoids into your body, uh, through inhalation or extraction, that's, uh, that's where the medicinal end is. And um, this is some of the circulatory pathways. And, and you know, we've, we've learned exactly how it's synthesized. And the genome of cannabis was sequenced in 2011. So there's a whole lot of uh, rich understanding of this plant now. So now let's look at pharmacodynamics. This is a little bit about how um, the body, uh, how cannabis works on the body itself. And for that, you have to understand the endocannabinoid signaling system, which is really the reason why there's a learner's high, why osteopathic nuclear treatment works, and why electroacupuncture works. Um, these are some slides I took from a sort of pharma outfit, but it can show you, they show you here that uh, there are two predominant cannabinoid receptors. There's probably more actually, but these were the first two ever discovered. And you can see here that um, CB1 is uh, uh, distributed in uh, numerous tissues, including the brain, uh, and nervous, system, nervous system, but also in muscle, liver, fat. GI tract, pancreas, and then CB2, more predominantly found in the immune system, although there are some neuronal distributions as well. These receptors are highly expressed in the brain, uh, and um, turns out they're, they're very widespread. They fall into the class of receptors called G-protein coupled receptors, um, which are very important, uh, the most famous G-protein coupled receptor, I think, is the rhodopsin receptor. And that's the one that allows you to see, allows the light uh, photons in the eye to translate into signals from the optic nerve. Um, but the G-protein coupled receptor is no, known for its transmembrane loops. There's seven of them that sneak across the membrane. They have a receptor on the uh, extracellular side that transmutes the signal into the intracellular side. Uh, then below that, you can see the drawings of the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2 arachidonyl glycerol are the two predominant endocannabinoids. These are phospholipid-derived metabolites that bind to and activate cannabinoid receptors. Uh, and you can see uh, that in the upper left, I've also written that this anandamide, uh, which comes from the Sanjic report for bliss, that a it's also not just an endocannabinoid, it also interacts with other systems in the body, such as the endovanamoid system. The, um, it binds to the triple E1 receptor, a um, little bit lower affinity, uh, and it binds to this other receptor called PPAR gamma. But the triple E1 receptor is, is the one that is responsible for helping you taste hot chili peppers. So it just, just goes to show that these are not just sort of 
these, these are integrated into other systems of the body, these endocannabinoids. Uh, and you can see the distribution of tissues again on the right. Uh, CNS, GI tract, liver, adipose tissue, muscle, pancreas, and CMB2, these are immune cells. This is a, um, we call them cartoons or crystal structure. There's no crystal structure, but it's kind of showing the different um, components of the crystal, of the, the protein structure of the CMB1 receptor. On the top is the, uh, uh, what you see here are the different transmembrane loops in the middle there. Um, those are called alpha helices. And then you have these um, extracellular side and intracellular side above and below. When you activate the extracellular side on, on top here, um, it's negatively coupled to amyloid cyclase. Um, that's what the signal that comes down here uh, causes, uh, a, negative, a negative coupling with amyloid cyclase. Uh, calcium conductance in the neuron is suppressed and um, there's an inhibition in the rectifying potassium channels. And this leads to a suppression of excitability of that neuron. Uh, the neuron, again, uh, it's very interesting to note that the mechanism of action of cannabinoids is retrograde, uh, and that's very different than classic neurotransmission, which has always been studied and taught to be anterograde. And that is to say, signals travel from presynaptic to postsynaptic neurons in uh, you know, a studied fashion. Here on the left is the neuromuscular junction showing the acetylcholine uh, being released and uh, binding to the acetylcholine receptor here uh, and then being chewed up in the, in the uh, synaptic space there, the cleft. However, the endocannabinoid system goes in the absolute opposite direction, uh, postsynaptic to presynaptic. Uh, endocannabinoids are synthesized on demand from the lipid bilayer of the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and then they are released through some kind of transporter. Uh, and then they go and bind to a cannabinoid receptor on the presynaptic terminal. Uh, and then there's an inactivation process uh, and a breakdown process of those, of those different of those endocannabinoids that happens inside the cell. So um, this system uh, is very unique in nature. Uh, there are a few other retrograde presynaptic receptors in dopamine signaling that have been studied, but this is the only signaling system that we know of in human biology, which its only mode of signaling in the neurons is retrograde. And what that allows endocannabinoid signaling to do is play an important role in feedback and regulation of neuronal excitability. Uh, that is to say, if there's too much signal coming from presynaptic to postsynaptic, the postsynaptic cell is able to send the signal back to the presynaptic neuron and tell it to reduce the signaling of that particular neurotransmitter, let's say it's glutamate. Uh, on the other hand, it can also help to upregulate signaling if there's not enough signal. So you play a kind of role as a symphony conductor at the neuronal, at the synapse. Uh, this is a picture of distribution of cannabinoid receptors in the rhesus monkey brain. You can see here that um, from frontal lobe to the uh, cerebellum, these are sagittal slices that have been taken. Uh, before the monkey was sacrificed, he was injected with a radio tracer uh, that binds to cannabinoid receptors. The red indicates highly dense uh, tissue distribution, and uh, green less dense, but not zero. Black is close to zero. Uh, so you can see as we go from the low and take these sagittal slices that cannabinoid receptors are everywhere in the brain, um, the cortex, the basal ganglia, uh, the caudate, caudate nucleus, excuse me, here, and the cerebellum here. Yeah, relatively few in the brain stem. 
same experiment has been done in, human, in the human brain. Here you have uh, uptake of this radio tracer in a human who is not sacrificed, but put under a PET, PET MRI scanner. You can see a similar distribution of these receptors in the human brain. This was done in NIH. These curves on the bottom are binding curves that are able to prove that, in fact, this is a cannabinoid receptor that, that uh, is being targeted. Uh, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. The authors uh, noted that CB1 receptor is one of the most abundant G-protein coupled receptors in the CNS, rivaling the abundance of benzodiazepine, stridal dopamine, and ionotropic glutamate receptors. It is tenfold higher than that of opioid receptors. So these are, this is a significant receptor system in the brain, you know, uh, in CNS. Because of the widespread distribution of cannabinoid receptors uh, in various tissues, you can imagine that, that they physiologically play important roles. Um, they help to reestablish cellular homeostasis, essentially, and have been shown to affect a large number of physiological processes, uh, feeding and energy balance, um, GI function, metabolism, the perception of pain, motor control, posture, learning and memory, and emotions, the immune responses, inflammatory responses, cardiovascular function, reproduction, bone formation. So it's quite a widespread system and studying it and understanding it really can help to guide a whole new understanding of human physiology. And uh, I recommend an article in the Journal of the American Academy, uh, the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association called the um, Endocannabinoid System and Osteopathic Perspective by uh, John McPartland. Uh, it really helps to put that sort of whole system medicine context to understand this uh, system's functions. And that article does a great job of that. I think it's available freely. So because we have this understanding of cannabinoids now, we can understand how it is that cannabis helps to stop nausea and vomiting in cancer patients, which is an indication that's been known about since the 70s, widespread known about in the United States. But for the longest time, people had no idea exactly how it worked. And now that we have this understanding of cannabinoid science, we can say, oh yeah, well there's cannabinoid type 1 receptors and neurons in the medullary nucleus solitarius in the, in the brain stem, which is, you know, as part of the a circuit, the emesis brainstem neural, neural circuit. Uh, the area is called the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Um, the cannabinoid inhibition of uh, receptors in this area of the serotonergic receptors uh, increase inhibition, inhibitory control, which may be why we get less uh, nausea and bomb. So uh, this explains uh, this, this, this inhibition is through that same retrograde signaling function that I was describing earlier. Uh, in, essentially, it happens with endocannabinoids, but also if you give the patient cannabinoids, you can, you can upregulate that inhibition process and downregulate the uh, activity of the part of the brain that makes you feel nauseous and want to vomit. There's other pathways too, but this, uh, this research was done in the in the shrew, lesser shrew is a type of uh, lab uh, animal. So anyway, um, that's part of how cannabinoid science can help you to understand its uh, function in medicine, cannabis's function in medicine. Uh, as far as pain goes, cannabinoid receptors localized to all kinds of areas in the um, anatomical distribution of tissues that are important for pain processing. Um, one of the most important ones to note is the periaqueductal gray, uh, which is an important area in the brain for um, downstream, sorry, a descending pain processing. That is to say, um, um, when pain is, uh, how the brain sort of shuts down pain. For example, if you are uh, stubbed your toe, but you're being chased by a 
like saber-toothed tiger, you really aren't able to um, address the pain at the time, so your body has a mechanism of suppressing that type, those type of pain signals. And that area that's responsible for that in the brain is full of cannabinoid receptors. They're also in the thalamus, the dorsal root ganglion, amygdala and cortex, uh, which are other important areas for pain processing. Um, so the immune cells, the, as we discussed, the CB2 receptors, uh, they are involved in modulating the release of chemokines and cytokines, which um, can induce inflammation and thereby also cause pain. So it turns out that, so well, that was just sort of static anatomy, but also you can, you can show that the cannabinoid system is part of the way that animals respond to the induction of pain through uh, nerve injury. Uh, at least nine different animal models have, of, this is quite torturous on the animals, I must say, but um, this is the state is here, so we should look at it, but um, there's surgically induced traumatic nerve or nervous system injuries um, have occurred, have, have been studied, and these different nine models constriction injuries, partial nerve ligation, sciatic or saphenous nerves, spinal nerve ligation of the L5 nerve, uh, spared nerve injury, spinal cord injury, tibial nerve injury, or streptozosin induced uh, injury, which is a model for diabetic neuropathy. And all of these models, this was an article published in Neurotherapeutics in 2009, um, they've been shown that cannabinoids are involved in the body's response to these painful injuries. So for example, in the chronic constriction injury, of the infraorbital nerve, cannabinoid rece one receptors are then upregulated in the trigeminal caudate called nucleus after this injury has occurred. Um, they're actually upregulated both in the, on the, in the nucleus on the same side that the nerve is cut and on the opposite side. Um, TB2 receptors uh, are increased in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord at the level of L5 uh, after you cut the L5 spinal nerve. Um, after you cut the saphenous nerve partially, you have an upregulation of mean opioid CB1 and CB2 protein levels. Um, that's found in both um, in the numerous tissues um, in the hind paw, both on the ipsilateral and contralateral side, uh, and the dorsal root ganglion, um, and the ipsilateral and contralateral uh, lumbar spinal cord, which is the uh, origin of the uh, saphenous nerve. And we see these changes one to seven days after we do this uh, injury in the nerve. If you cut the tibial nerve, which is also in the lower extremity, you have an increase of CB1 messenger RNA in the opposite side of the brain, which is uh, the pain, pain relay station, the thalamus, just one day after the injury. The spinal cord injury model has shown um, that there is um, mechanical allodynia, that is uh, hypersensitive, pain hypersensitivity, decreases um, when you give uh, cannabinoid medicines to a spinal cord injured animal cannabinoid animals called WIN, um, but there's no decrease in the effectiveness of that medication over time on the pain, uh, it's just different from morphine.